All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I hope we are having a good day, a good evening, a good year. How many days into the year? Four? Four. 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 Praise God that we made it, 2023. Some folks, this isn't their testimony, but it's ours. Amen? Amen. 2023, here we are. Whether we like it or not, there's nothing we can do to rewind the hand of time. Uh, but I am uh, incredibly gra- uh, glad to be back. I've been itching a little bit, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for all of those who were able to make it tonight. Let's do uh, just a, a few or a couple minute recap on where we are in 2 Corinthians. Tonight, we want, we want to deal with beginning uh, the topic. We want to deal with the light of Christ's gospel. And this is so important as we lay the foundation on tonight. Remember, uh, 2 Corinthians is a different type of letter. This is the second uh, letter addressed to the body of Christ in the city of Corinth. If you remember, uh, Paul uh, went on somewhat of a spiritual rampage, his first letter. He began to diagnose certain spiritual abuses and things that were happening that were sexually immoral. Uh, There were a body of Christ that were abusing spiritual gifts and they were creating divisions and splitting uh, and creating factions among one another. And it's something that's unfortunately not uncommon, but it's even uh, more common uh, now in the church. Second Corinthians, and I've told you, if you did not remember in my own studied opinion, has to be one of the Apostle Paul's most autobiographical books because this is really uh, him putting himself out there in a very open light. He's being extremely transparent. He, once we dive a little bit deeper in the chapters, we're going to see uh, him kind of put himself on the platform uh, to, let him, to let the folks know that, yes, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, but I got some struggles. I've got some things going on in the inside of me that I have to fight with on a daily basis. And for me personally, can I be honest, for a brother of his magnitude to be able to walk the, the way he's walked and to do some of the great things that he's done in Jesus' name, for him uh, to be open about some of the issues of his heart gives me nothing but confidence. Nothing but confidence. It lets me know that I'm not by myself. And that's what he does. And remember, he's got some false teachers within Second Corinthians that have kind of put him out there and they've spoke uh, bad against his name. His character is, is being stabbed. And we talked about that weeks ago, uh, that if you follow Christ, uh, sometimes your character uh, will come under attack. But if you remember, if you live a life and we're going to talk about that in depth on tonight, if you live a life surrounded in holiness and righteousness, it doesn't matter what the narrative is, because the truth that you live will always speak louder than the lie. Come on and say amen. Amen. So again, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you are being who you are supposed to be, just let the chips fall where they may. God will use whatever that is in your life to reap glory from it. Amen. So it's important that we understand that. And one thing he's going to deal with primarily, he's going to be real explicit about letting us know that ministry isn't easy. Show of hands. Like ministry isn't easy. You, you walk with Christ long enough and you walk with him. Uh, uh, I mean, really side by side. This thing gets tough. This thing gets really tough. It's not easy. Uh, but Paul, he again, he reminds us. Uh, of that on tonight. So we're going to continue to push on in 2 Corinthians. Remember, there's almost a, a, a defensive a posture that the Apostle Paul has taken to not only defend the gospel, but now he's had to go, go a step deeper and defend his character. Any questions or comments on the foundation of uh, 2 Corinthians? We good? All right. Let's get into it on tonight. One thing I will tell you before we get into uh, the light of Christ's gospel, I want us to pay attention to two things. One, that Jesus, that his gospel is full of what? Come on. It's full of what? It's nothing but light. All right. And this is going to make more sense the deeper we go. And the gospel belongs to who? Okay. With an apostrophe S. Take us back to third grade English. means it's possessive. That gospel belongs to to Jesus and nobody else. 
All right. It's his gospel, his rules, his left and right limits. All right. His righteousness, his glory, his divinity, his majest, his magic. It's, it's all his and his gospel, because it belongs to him. It's full of what? All right. We can't we can't remember that. Because if, if there's a VS battle or versus battle, what is the light having to battle with? Come on. Somebody's up tonight. All right. That's the battle. Light is always at odds with darkness and darkness. Come on, somebody is always at odds with the light. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's what it is. Don't be, don't be caught off guard. I don't care. Well, I just got saved last year, PC. Well, praise God. Well, let me let me let you know that light and darkness are always at odds, and it's not just in odds in the earth, but it's in it's at odds within us, right? Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter seven, and I'm not going and I challenge you to go back and read that. But Paul said it seems like, uh, and I just put this for seven, so you can go back and read the whole chapter. But Paul says. It seems like every time I try to do good, evil is always present. You remember that? He said every time I attempt to do good in the name of God, evil is always there. Look at me, staring me right in my face. All right. So light and dark, light and darkness. The battle is not only on the outside, but it's on the inside. Let's get to Second Corinthians four. So can I can I tell you 2022 and I'll write it up here because it's 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 long gone. All right. We'll put long gone with three exclamation points, one for the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. All right. But I tell you what, what did I witness personally in 2022? I witnessed uh, Christian marriages, one in particular. I won't call any names out because folks, they, they watch and they listen. But I, I saw uh, marriages between Christian folks disintegrate, rip away in 2022. I saw Christians give up and tap out in 2022. I saw church leaders be exposed in 2022. I saw pastors publicly on major platforms and on small platforms turn in the keys to their churches and say, you know what? I can't do this anymore. That's what I saw in 2022. All right. And we've got to remember where we are. And this is going to play right into the, in the text on tonight. But if we go back to First Timothy Chapter four, verse one. Is anybody familiar with that passage of scripture? Come on. Yeah, come on. My brother, I love you, man. All right. That in the latter days, in the last days, there will be many, the Bible says, that shall depart, meaning leave the faith. The same faith that they believed in the same Christ that saved them and filled their hearts that in the last days, many will depart from that faith. All right. So who is that a shout out to believer or non-believer? Believer. The believer. So that means there is a supernatural propensity. If we're not doing what we're supposed to do and being who we have been called to be, that there's always that time and place down to the year, month, day, second and week, that if we give ourselves away, uh, not unto the Lord, that we too can fall away. And it's not so much falling away like uh, Brother Dante quoted in the text. But when they fall away, the word of God says that they will take heed to seducing spirits. All right. What does it mean to be seductive? To what? To tempt. To tempt right. To lure you into something, to lure you into believing something and not only to be led away to seducing spirits, but to give yourself over to doctrine. What does the word doctrine mean? It's a form of what? A set of beliefs or teachings from who? What does the verse say from who? From demons. All right. So believe it or not, there are there is there is there are de there are demonic doctrines that exist in the earth. And if you are not careful, it's not so much that you will fall away from the faith. But when you fall away, you will lend your mind, body and your soul. All three of those things you will render unto the opposite of Jesus Christ. It's important that we not forget that. I know we don't like to deal with it. But I saw it all in 2022. The goal, I believe, in 2023 
and we're going to see it here in 2 Corinthians 4 tonight, is to be spiritually aware to our, what's going on in the lives of our brothers and sisters. Okay, so we don't end up in 1 Timothy 4.1. Are you hearing me on tonight? Amen. That means we've got to be in each other's business. And I'm not talking about, man, I wonder what Deb's doing. Yeah, I wonder, yeah, you see what she was wearing? And no, no, no. All right, that's fleshly, and I'm serious. But I'm talking about getting in people's business, meaning doing life with one another outside of Wednesday and Sunday. That means we're going to have to be deliberate about getting to know one another on a deeper level. All right. Jason, I may have to divulge some things to you that my wife might not even know, but the Holy Spirit has done something in me and said, I need to confide in you because you are a brother that's going to help me along the way to deal with my, Rome, my, with my Roman 7, that you won't put my business out on social media and you won't gossip around the city of Denver and Lincoln County uh, about what's going on in my heart. But now, because you love me so much, and we're going to see this in a little bit in Galatians 5.13 as it pertains to 2 Corinthians 4. But you love me so much that you don't want me to come. You don't want me to fall here that you're going to lift me up. You're going to hold my hand. You're going to hold me accountable. Let me say that again. You're going to hold me accountable. And we're going to talk about this a little bit on Sunday in our brand new venue. Praise God. I'm trying to be good. Uh, but in 2023, some of us need accountability partners. We've been, trying to, we've been trying to live safe for too long. I'm trying, God have mercy. I do not want to preach tonight. I want, I want to teach. But some of us have done this thing by ourselves for way too long, and we've suffered because of it. When you have people in your life that hold you accountable, not to themselves, but to the gospel, to the light of Christ's gospel, it will change your life. I have people I do life with that hold me accountable and tell me, brother, I know you preach. I know you teach. You do all of that. But that ain't right. That's not right. And here's the word of God as the measuring stick to prove to you in love that that's not right. We need accountability. We amen. amen. We need accountability in 2023. I'm hoping that from this that none of us will fall here in first Timothy four. I, I, that's that's my that's my hope. That's my desire. But it starts with holding each other accountable. Amen. Amen. All right. Second Corinthians four one. Let's get into the word. Comments or questions before we actually get into the scripture. We good. OK. Camille taking notes. Praise God. God is up to something. Uh, verse one. Therefore, since we have this ministry, what ministry? The gospel. Where do we find the gospel according to the word of God? I love it. All right. So when anybody else asks you, Paul defines, and I'll write it here. Paul defines the gospel right here. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses one, two, three, and four. Paul says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, do not what? Okay, I want you to underline that. Okay. Don't lose heart. The faithful of God, the people of God, that's, what I, that's, that's all, the, all the things that I pointed to that I said I witnessed personally in 2022 were Christians falling right here in line with verse one. They were growing weary. They were losing heart. And it's easy to do if our focus is shifted or taking, taken off the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. That's one of the things that I've kind of been preaching even to, to our elders. And I'll say it again is, yes, we're in transition right now. Yes, God is expanding our territory. Yes, God is making provision and le leading us into a building. And we're growing. New faces are coming. More people are being saved. More people are being changed, delivered, regenerated, revived, sanctified. Right. And a lot of stuff going on. But we can't get away from why we're doing what we've been called to do. All right. And that's that more souls can come to know who Jesus Christ. All right. Because we can become busy bodies and get caught in the numbers and the moving and the shaping and the shifting and forget what it's all about. And it's about who or what souls. Am I right? Amen. 
Proverbs 11:30 declares that the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. But to they that win souls, they're what? Wise. Come on. They're wise. One of the greatest things, one of the most wise things that a man or woman of God can ever do or to lead souls to the light of Jesus Christ's gospel. Amen. All right. So let's go back into the verse. Do not lose heart. And that's why accountability is so good. And even Jesus led the disciples in twos. Go back to Matthew chapter 10. I tell you, there's deeper. It's deeper than that. But there's accountability, accountability in that in that uh, that partnership. Right. Because typically, hopefully you won't find both of us. You know, me and Ross are, are accountability partners. Hopefully both both his heart and my heart aren't super weary. Are we in trouble? <laughs> right. But hopefully one of us can have enough God in us in the moment to say, hey, Ross, get up, shake it off. Shake it off. Or he can tell me, hey, Cliff, get up, shake it off, brother. Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. Right. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Watch verse two. But we have renounced what? The hidden things of shame. All right. Uh, I, listen, the path to sincere deliverance is renouncing things that bring shame to your heart. God, I wish I had time. Are you hearing me? If you really want to be set free, it starts in being integral and being sincerely honest about the things that bring you shame. And the amazing thing about this, watch this, uh, Brother Chapman, is that the shameful things aren't a surprise to Jesus Christ. And he's beg he's wanting you. The enemy doesn't want you. He want the enemy always wants to remind you of the shameful things to keep you bound and to keep you cuffed. Right. To, to lead you to believe that, oh, man, God, God can't really love me like the Bible says. I've done this and I've done that. I, I was addicted to this and this has been a stronghold in my mind. I'm da 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 da. And he keeps playing that sad little shameful violin in the hearts of God's people. And God is saying, just renounce it. This is the doorway to deliverance tonight. This is deep. When we can renounce the shameful things, what happens is it now opens up the opportunity for light. This is the key word tonight for light to shine into dark places of our hearts. Are you hearing me? Amen. This is powerful. Now, if you if you like living in chains, then this word for you, whether you're sitting in this barn tonight or listening or live, this ain't a word for you. But if you want to walk and experience the true liberty of Jesus Christ, this is a word for you tonight. Amen. So renounce the hidden things of shame. Paul says we're not walking in craftiness. Remember what we're talking about, the light of Christ's gospel. We're not walking in craftiness, nor are we handling the word of God. How? Remember, he's having to defend his what? The gospel, the gospel but he's defending personally his what? We said it earlier tonight. His, his character. All right. He's having to defend his character because he's been accused him and some other brothers, if you go back and read exegetically of handling the word of God very deceitfully, very use, using tricks and trying to be cunning. And Paul said, "Nah, I can prove it. Watch this. He says, because by the manifestation of what? Truth. Underline that. If you want to know whether you're handling the word of God the way it should be handled, then truth will always manifest. That's right. okay? It'll manifest. And if something manifests, it, it, it comes to light where folks can see it. <laughs> this is this is why I believe deliverance is so powerful, because, again, it is absolute visible, metaphysically tangible proof that the power of Jesus Christ is powerful than Satan himself. It's so it's so beautiful. And Paul says you can see the truth that's manifested all throughout my ministry. <laughs> <laughs> if I handle it deceitfully, then why would truth manifest? Right, right. I'm not trying to trick God's people. I'm not selling snake oil, 1-800 snake oil. I'm not, I'm not telling you that this is a special cloth, right, or a special water that if you drink uh, demons, it'll make demons tremble and you'll inherit, check your bank account and you'll have a million dollars in there. Paul said, <laughs> and we laugh, but Paul said, this ain't that type of party. Right. I'm coming to give you a gospel that's going to lead you to what? Eternal life. Watch this. He says, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to what? In the sight of who? 
So he's like, God, God's the big, he's, he's, a, he's a big set of eyes that's watching me. And Paul says, I'm so sensitive to conscience. Did we not deal with that in 1 Corinthians? Y'all remember that? Sensitivity to conscience, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, right? It's something that if it's new to you, I challenge you to go back and I'll write it up here. Go back and read it. It's a short chapter, but learning to be sensitive to conscience. And the example, uh, you know, because there, there's this meat thing going on with the Gentiles and the Jews, and I don't eat that because it's considered unclean. And, and, and Paul says, listen, if me eating meat offends you, then I ain't going to eat meat in front of you, right? Because I'm, I don't want to be a stumbling block for you getting to know Jesus Christ on a deeper level. But please believe me, when I get home, I'm speaking to me, I like Marco's all meat, <laughs> Okay. Now, I'll, I'll bite the bullet in front of you when you come to my house, because I, I know because I'm sensitive to your conscience. But believe me, they're gone. I saw them on the camera. Marcos, large meat lovers, you know the address. All right. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's honoring the conscience of other people. Why is this important? Why do you think being sensitive to the to other people's conscience is extremely important? This is not a trick question. You put them before yourself, very good and not wrong, but watch this. What about if I'm a more mature believer than they are? Bingo. All right, Bing, I, I, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I'm, I'm, I may be super mature. They may be a babe in Christ. There still may be a lack of understanding. And I, as, as uh, Brother Josh has said, I don't wanna be the hurdle. Right. Being a Christian and living saved in a dark world is difficult enough. Why do it? Why does another born again, blood washed believer need to make it even more difficult? Don't do it. So Paul says, I'm sensitive to conscience in the sight of who? All right. Not folks, not people, but in the sight of almighty God. Comments or questions before we get into verse three. Celine, you had something? Okay. Verse three, but even if our gospel is what? Veiled. Right, veiled, hidden. I love it. Even if it's veiled, it's veiled to do those that are what? Okay. Folks that are dead or dying, right? They're dying. Whose minds the God of what? Has done what? Okay, so a blind mind, and get this, and you've got to see this through a different set of lenses tonight. Because a mind physically can't be blind. But Paul is talking spiritual. Because if we say blind, the first thing we think about are a set of eyes. Or if God's only given you one eye, praise God in your one eye. All right? We talk about blind losing sight. But Paul says from a spiritual perspective, you have the ability to be blinded in the mind. This is deep. And the one who's blinding you is not Jesus Christ because we've determined that his gospel possessively is filled with what? Life. All right. So if your mind has been blinded, it's because of the little G of this earth. Who is who? Satan, Satan himself, the prince of air. Am I making sense on tonight? Yes. Now he says, these people do not believe lest the what? The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should do what? Okay. So it takes the light of the gospel of Christ to shine on them. For them to experience the light. Okay, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping this is a word of encouragement for somebody tonight, because some of us, most of us have family members that don't believe what we believe, um, whether it's children, siblings, grandchildren. We've all got somebody, maybe even maybe even one or two somebodies who don't believe. You know, and, and the an encouragement thing tonight, the encouraging thing should be tonight. You don't have to give them anything else. But what? The light of Christ's gospel, because you can give them a bunch of you and you'll never see transformation. 
But if you give them the gospel of Christ, it has a light. Read it. We read it tonight that can shine on them, that can bring them out of darkness into the what? The marvelous light. Amen. Hmm? This is why it's so powerful that if we don't preach anything else but Christ, him crucified and resurrected. His gospel brings people out of darkness and allows them to experience the marvelous light. So even if you may not even live to see it, drop the seed of the gospel in their heart. And hopefully one day, even if you are not allowed to see it, that person or those individuals will one day shine. Why? Because the gospel is inside of them now. It's powerful because it wears us down. I don't know about you, but it wears my spirit. It wears my soul down to see people who I care about dearly not walk in the st statues and the precepts of Christ. It bothers me because I've experienced it. So I know God's good. So then I look almost condemnationally in a very sinful way. And I have to repent oftentimes and point out their flaws, deficiencies, shortcomings, mistakes and issues. And the Holy Spirit says that was you. Remember, Paul said, don't don't forget that you were once them. And that's where the gospel, it's two edge. Hebrews 412, because as much as I'm trying to plant the seed in them to get light, that same word that I'm giving them cuts me. Because <laughs> Christ quickly reminds me that's you. And the only thing that separates him or her from you is that you possess me and they don't. Hebrews 4.12 declares that the word of God is what is powerful, sharp, quick than any two edged sword, rightfully to pierce and dividing even the soul and spirit and joints and the marrow. And as a discerner of what the thoughts and the intents of a man or woman's heart. Are you with me? Amen. So it's twofold. But it's still light and light that comes from Christ's gospel will always overcome, overcome darkness. Amen. Amen. All right. Comments or questions before we keep pushing. Verse five, for we do not preach what? OK, make sure I, I said it, didn't even know that verse was coming, but we talked about it. We don't preach ourselves. Okay? And we have a tendency to do that because it's easy to do. We preach ourselves and there's nothing wrong with testimonies. All right? We know what the word of God says in Revelation, Revelation 12, I think 12, 11. For we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of what? Our testimony. All right. But when we talk about leading people out of darkness into light, Paul says it does not include you preaching yourself. All right. We're not. Paul said we're not preaching ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the who? The Lord. Notice that he doesn't call him the savior. You see that? Amen. The Lord. Jesus is Savior, but he's also Lord. <laughs> and this is this is a deep transition. And you probably heard me say this a couple of times. A lot of us in, Ameri in American Christendom have welcomed Christ to come into our hearts and be Savior. But many of us reject him for being Lord. And you might not like when I say that, but that's fact, because when he's Lord, your life looks different. When he's Lord, your life, it, your life produces something that it didn't produce when he was just Savior. And if you know anything about Lord or Lordship, Lords do what? They rule over. They have complete dominion and control. Are you hearing me? Yes. Finances belong to him. Marriages belong to him. Raising your children belong to him. Raising grandchildren, it belongs to him. Who you are in your job, it belongs to him. He wants to be Lord over everything, and rightfully so. He saved you from hell. Why, why can't he be Lord? Right? Amen, okay, all right. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your who? We're your bond servants for whose sake? Jesus. All right. So when we come into the faith, we have been called to serve who? Jesus. But as it pertains to the body of Christ, we've been called to serve who? We've been called to serve who? Say it again, Sister Tina. Each other. 
That's what we miss. Galatians 5.13 declares, for we have been given that liberty and unto that liberty it is not to appease our flesh, but by love we serve who? One another. If, the, if Emmanuel, where we encounter Christ, is going to become ultimately who God has destined and prophetically told us who we are going to be, it is going to start with harnessing Galatians 5 and 13. Please put that scripture in your heart tonight. Don't leave this building without letting that scripture get somewhere in your notes, in your Bible, and in your mind. Serving one another. And the church, Tina, I, I love you, but we get it wrong. We think once we get called to certain positions of power and authority, like Ephesians 4 and 11, that people are supposed to serve us. But we got it backwards because in all actuality, the higher Christ calls you, the more of a bond servant you should become, not the other way around. Pastor Cliff don't really need you to serve him. I'm willing to lend myself to you to be your servant and I'm OK with it. If you need somebody, I'll serve. I'll serve you. I don't mind getting in the trenches and rubbing my, rolling my sleeves up. It's okay. I still know who I am at the end of the day. But it's the thing that the church, I think, has flipped. We think, man, I sit in a position of power and authority. The folks should be serving me. And when I go back and look at the life of Jesus Christ in the Synoptic Gospels, he was the master of servants. He's the one that should have been getting served and catered to every second, every minute, every day. In fact, when he was born, if they had any sense, Camille, they would have kicked everybody out the hotel and gave the entire hotel to Jesus, Mary and Joseph. But they didn't. <clears throat> they didn't. And yet Jesus asked the question to the disciples in the, in the synoptics, who is greater, the one that sits at me or one who serves? Jesus says it's the one who serves. We got to get this. We've been saved and feel not to sit on the bench, but we've called, we've been called to serve one another. To serve one another in any capacity necessary. Are you hearing me? Like we gotta understand this. We're missing it. Like Job. I'm sorry? It's like when Job was uh, restored. After yeah. He praying yeah. His, yeah. Yeah. Thing, yeah. 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 Like it's about, it's about everybody else. Right. But this this is a level. This takes a level of great spiritual maturity. And sadly, many of us, je we're just not here. But the good news is, is we can get here. All right. But it starts understanding that liberty, because like Paul says in Galatians five, some of us have gotten that liberty and we've used it to appease what makes us feel good. And Paul says it's the opposite. This liberty should actually be killing the thing that wants to be fed so the spirit can go and serve other people. It's a beautiful concept, but we're missing it. Bond servants for Jesus sake. Verse six, for it is the God who commanded what? The light. Out of what? The Where do we find that? All the way in the beginning, right? Genesis 1, 3. Genesis 1, 3. We see the creator Yahweh of all of eternity, who's always existed, open his mouth and with word, what happened? Something what? Did what? Manifest. Manifest. See, when we think about the first, because what, 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 what is intercourse? Intercourse produces what? It manifests. It produces something, right? A child. And we think about, well, well that's Adam and Eve. Actually, no. Right? Actually, no. Because God, the first intercourse biblically is God opened up his mouth and something being. Yeah. That's it's what it was. He said a thing and a thing was produced. He said a thing and it was manifested. <laughs> That's really technically the first form of reproduction came from God's mouth to speak. That's power, y'all. To say a thing and for a thing to be. That's amazing. But Paul says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown the light in our what? In our hearts. So the same God, and I can go over here because we, we ain't on video tonight. So the same God that, that man, there ain't no light. Okay, it's light, right? So that same God that can do that in the earth, that can turn the light, that turn the light switch on in the earth, is the same God that can turn the light switch on in the heart of unbelievers. So God, God didn't stop flipping light switches at Genesis 1-3 because he sent his son. 
And then his son went back to take the rightful place on the throne. Right. And then uh, and then Jesus sent who and introduced who? The Holy Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit going around and doing what? Flipping lights. Turning them on. Turn them on. Turning them on. We need more light switches turned on. And it's only going to come from what? His gospel. His word has to get out. Satan don't want it to get out because even he knows the power of it. The gospel has to get out. And sadly, if I wish I had time, but I could take you back to the Olivet Discourse of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says he is not coming back to do anything prophetically and to ultimately deliver the kingdom of God back into his father's hands until the gospel is preached every single corner of the earth. So I believe we play a part as the as the ecclesia, as the governing body in the earth. We can help speed up the coming of Christ by getting the light of Christ's gospel in dark places. Because Jesus said out of his own mouth before he was crucified, he will not capital N O T will not return until his gospel is preached every part of the earth. Yes, yes. We got work to do. The hearts to give light. I'm sorry. Let me read over verse six. For it is a God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown where? In our, In our hearts. Jeremiah 17 and 9. All right. Deceitfully wicked and desperate. Jeremiah was talking about the heart. Okay, the heart needs light because it's dark. That's why we can't, you know, these cute little quotes and stuff we put online and hanging on across in our homes, follow your heart. Be careful about that. Okay, follow the light of Jesus Christ. Because it says here, our hearts to give the light of the what? Knowledge of the what though? The glory, the glory of God. So you don't even begin to have the knowledge of the glory of God until Jesus Christ flips the light switch on in your heart. Are you hearing me tonight? Amen. You have no knowledge of the glory of God until the light switch comes on. Right, period. Then he says. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen. No Amen. This even, this even says, uh, remind, it says, Paul reminds us that though we may think we're at the end of our rope, we are never at the end of our hope. Ooh, t shirt. I love it. I love it. You had something? Yeah, the, uh, the, the treasure in the jar of clay is that like we are, we are earthen vessels, something that will decay. But right. the, the entirety of that light showing out is that. That, that's God showing that his eternity surpasses everything that we have. Amen. And as long as that's inside, no matter what comes against us. Yeah. As you said, it's going to get run over. That's it. Yep. Amen. That was a good news call, too. Amen. I'm going to have to edit that out. The thing. Thank you, Ross. Um, where you at? Seven, you said, brother? Ten. Okay, I'm sorry. Man, you, okay, you pushed. <laughs> I love it. Always caring about, this is good. I want us to highlight this verse. So I'm glad you landed here, Ross. This is, this is powerful. Always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be what? In our body. Right, what is Paul talking about here? Because this is, this is something we, we need to hang on to. We should leave our life and let the life of Christ live be lived through us we should live kind of well just like christ did. yeah not kind of but just like yeah 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 right are you, are you hearing that mm -hmm. like so it, it's it's not possible here's a good example i think and then if not then tell me if you have a better one but it's impossible to, to say that we hang out with jesus as much as we say we do but nothing ever manifests to prove that we've been hanging out with him the way we say we've been hanging out with him OK. Right. Like you can tell it's almost like a message. It's kind of Sunday ish, 
but you can tell who you've been hanging around. I don't want to go there tonight. Just, just read between the lines. Okay? Your attitude, your demeanor, your, your, your facial expressions, your body language, what comes out of you, the group, the certain people you encircle yourself. It is very easy to, I mean, it's, it's just obvious. I'm, I'm sorry. Right? And it's impossible, I believe, to hang around Christ as much as we should be hanging around him and not seeing that manifested glory be expressed in our body. Are you hearing me? Does that make any sense? Okay. All right. So hang on to that. Verse 11. For for we who live are always what? (laughs) Delivered to death. Like that. That's like easy to preach. It's real cool to probably put on a T-shirt. It could even probably be the mission statement for the year 2023. But that's one of those things, Brother Smitty, that sounds good. But but it's a little bit more challenging to live out. Right. I'll die for Christ. I'll die right now when there's people in other parts of the world that actually are dying for the name of Christ. Okay. Just just mull on it. Just meditate on it. Meditate on it. It's deep. It's intended to be. This is a challenging, life changing word tonight. OK, for for again, verse 11, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested. How? I just talked about it in our mortal flesh. Notice it didn't say immortal flesh, because at that point, who cares? We're in the eternal presence of Jesus Christ. Mortality, in fact, at that point does what? It, it puts on immortality. immortality and corruptible puts on. Incorruptible. Somebody know their Bible, right? So it's all good. But as long as we're on this side of heaven, there should be something manifested of Jesus Christ if we're living for him in these mortal bodies. Then he says here. Uh, da, 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 verse 12. So then death is working in us. But what? Life. But life is in you. So Paul is saying, listen, I may be getting persecuted, perplexed, as it says right here in the scripture. I may be hard pressed on every side. I may be in despair. I may be struck down, but it's for your sake because it's in my being struck down where you have access now to eternal life because I'm giving you the light of Christ's gospel. All right, it's the same thing we see in Jesus' life. All right? Jesus, the, his death, the death of Jesus was the precursor to him what? Being resurrected. Without him dying, there could be what? No resurrection. Are you, are you, right? Paul is saying, without me being who I've got to be for the, for the cause of Christ, <laughs> you ain't got no gospel. <laughs> So thank God for him keeping me alive, escaping the city, not dying from being beaten and crucified, that I can come and deliver you the gospel. Amen. Amen. Like Paul is saying, ain't no limits to this. I'm willing to I'm willing to give up my life so you can come to know the light of the gospel of Christ. So good. Then he says here, what's my time? We got a little bit. And since we have the same uh, spirit of what? Faith. Faith. According to what? That I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Verse 14, knowing that he who raised up the Lord. Okay. So who raised up the Lord? Okay. Almighty God. Jesus will also do what? Raise us up. Okay. Raise us up. Don't forget that. That's confidence. That's hope. And we will one day be raised up. I'm living for that, Brother Tucker. I don't know about you, but I'm, 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 I'm expecting that. Right? That's, that's the expectation. Then it says, raise up with Jesus and we'll do what? Present, Present us. That word in the original language, exhibit us. Jesus will put us on exhibit. <laughs> Jesus will put us on, uh, on exhibit for the Father to see. Just, 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 just meditate on that. Jesus will put us on exhibit before the Father. <laughs> I love it. My God. And he says here in verse 15, for all things or for what? Okay, this is a servant's mentality. Paul is not in it to win it for himself or for his traveling ministers that are going and ministering all over the country. All over, all over this part of the country anyway, right? 
He says, we're doing this for your sakes, for your benefit. So how dare you come in here and try to judge or smear my character and accuse me of teaching something that I'm not teaching? Because everywhere I've gone, there's been saving of life and soul. There's been truth that's been manifested. What are you talking about? Because some of you remember or may not remember, but back in Romans uh, and a little bit in First Corinthians, Paul is accused of something called antinomianism. You know, some of you show hands. OK, so go back and check that out. But he's accused of ministering that type of truth or not truth, but falsity. And it's it's not it's not right. He said, so how dare you? I'm, 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 I'm doing this for your sake. Like I could be somewhere else in hiding and I'm, I'm assuming I might make it in heaven. But uh, there's a call on my life. And I answered and picked up the phone. And because I picked it up out of obedience, here I am to introduce you to the same light that I've been walking in since the road to Damascus. Okay. So Paul's mentality here right tonight is that Jesus is nobody's best kept secret. He's not hoarding Christ to himself, that he's painting the picture and the mental illustration of him being on the road to Damascus because he remembered that experience. And now is trying to introduce as many people to Christ as he can so they, too, can experience Christ. Okay. Hang on to that. Then he says here, and we're almost done. Last verse for all things are for your sakes that what? Grace. Grace. It's the stuff that the Lord gives us, Ross, that we don't deserve. Okay, we don't deserve. Didn't we see that in Ephesians? Where my marker? Didn't we see that in Ephesians? Two, eight. Yeah, y'all know where I'm at. Where my marker? What in the world? I don't know. I put it in my pocket. I'm losing. Yeah, I'm losing. I'm getting old. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For well, it's by the grace of God that we are saved, not of works, lest any man boast, is what the word of God says. That the grace, verse 15, having spread through the many, may cause what? Thanksgiving, thanksgiving to abound to the what? Glory to God. For thanksgiving to abound. For thanksgiving to abound. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. And we can put 18 as well. Pray without ceasing. Always giving thanks to God and everything. Give thanks to the Lord for this is the will of God through you or through Christ Jesus concerning who? The us. OK, so it's it's Thanksgiving, not only abounding to the glory of God, but Thanksgiving about a, a Thanksgiving abounding in your hearts. Likewise, you hear me on tonight. Amen. Amen. All right. Comments or questions? Where do we end up? Verse 15. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 15.